Yeah, record. All right. So today we're uh, lesson two twelve in our comparison of the synoptic gospels. Jesus weeps over the city. Is the title of it? We'll be looking at Luke nineteen twenty. 21, that's not right. 19, 41 to 44, okay. And there we're on the chart, we're at uh, line number uh, 187. And uh, next week, Lord willing, if we're still here, we'll be going through uh, Jesus Cleanses the Temple again. And then after that, we drop down to 192 where he curses a fig tree on the way in. And then the religious leaders challenge his authority as he's teaching. And we'll be going through a lot of that in the next uh, many weeks. All right, so the passage today is in Luke 19, 41 to 44. And then when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation." All right, so last week we saw the triumphal entry and the message that the passes were crying out was, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, we took the quote from MacArthur's commentary. They're shouting Psalm 118, verse 26, a psalm of salvation, sometimes called the conqueror's psalm, which a hundred years before the Jews shouted at Maccabeus because he was triumphing over the Syrians as he entered back into the city. So they're praising the name of the Lord, calling on the Son of David to save them, and in the physical sense, from occupying Rome and all their other enemies that they faced. And we, at this time also we saw that Luke 19.39, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. That's a very important statement that we'll be looking at a little bit further on. They knew what the people were saying, and they're and offended. They wanted Jesus to do what they knew they couldn't. They couldn't silence the masses. They're outraged at the messianic honor that's being given to this their arch enemy, whom they've wanted and looked and planned and schemed on how they could kill him, and they wanted him dead. To them, this was blasphemy. And he answered and said to them, I tell you, and we took this from Gil, a truth which may be depended on, that you may be assured of. This he spake with great earnestness, fever, and courage. It's a reference to it's a strong claim of his deity, reference to the words in Habakkuk 2.11, For the stones shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timbers shall answer it. They saw and heard plainly that the multitude had proclaimed Christ, King, and Messiah as he's coming over the hill. And they're saying all this, and they don't know who they're talking about. The masses are saying this. They're caught up in the moment. And when we looked last week, Mark 11, 11, and Jesus entered into Jerusalem, into the temple. Very important there. He went, looked round about upon all things, and now the evening tide was come. He went out into Bethany with the twelve. He enters the temple, looks all around, and we'll cover that next week. Uh, what he saw and, and the action that he takes the next day. But our passage today is found only in Luke after the rebuke of the Pharisees, crying out for him to stop them from praising him. And this is in a stark contrast with the previous verse, where they're praising him, everybody's screaming and yelling and singing Hosanna. And he, when he came near, beheld the city and wept over it. Everybody else is praise and glory and hallelujah, and he's sobbing. If you go back to verse 37, And when he came near, when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. So you're going up from Bethany, you top the Mount of Olives, you have a full, magnificent view of the city across the valley. 
You can see Mount Moriah with the temple covered in gold just across the narrow Kidron Valley. The city rose even higher behind the temple. It was crowned with Herod's palace in the far distance. Gil says he lifted up his eyes and looking wishfully on it and beholding the grandeur and the magnificence of it, the number of the houses and the stately structures in it, knowing what calamities in a few years would come upon it, he wept. All right, so we got this picture here. This is the temple, or this is overlooking the city. And right up over here is the Mount of Olives. He'd be probably coming down across right here. When you top this mountain, the very first thing you see is the temple. And there it is it's with gold. And then you have the lower city here. Then you have the upper city. And then right over here is Herod's uh, palace. There's a, one of the two possible... Uh, Galgotha locations. Both of them have been very highly commercialized. But when you cross this mountain, when you top the Mount of Olives, if you left Bethany and walked the two miles, it's probably, if you left at daybreak, it's two miles, what, an hour? With this large group of people. The sun is behind you, shining down on the face of this Tabernacle, the temple, which is covered in gold. It's on the terrain and what they're wearing on their feet. Huh? That two hours, it depends on the terrain and what they're wearing on yeah, their feet. Yeah, sandals. Anyhow, so inside this, you have the court of the Gentiles, which is out here. It would be way out on this side, and I think there's a wall right there. So this part of it, all over here is the court of the Gentiles, would be on the top, top of the Temple Mount. You go through this gate, then you have the beautiful gate, which is where you go into the court of the women. There is a sign right here. This is a, a Jewish area only. If you enter through that sign as a Gentile, you'd be killed. That stone you right there. So then you have the court of the Gentile, or court of the women. Then you have the the inside court here of the priest. Then you have the actual structure with the holy place, and then the holy of holies behind it, with the altar and, and the labor and everything's right here. All these are storage houses for the priests and everything that goes along with this, all the ceremonies that are done there. So as a side bit. They're looking to build another temple, the fourth temple, right there on this mountain. And the funny thing is, is there is a fault line runs right through there, right along here. Lower city, upper city is separated. There is a tectonic fault line. This is hard granite. This is limestone. When he touches the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives splits north to south, that shakes this place, this whole side is going to collapse. They're going to get rid of the temple that has to be built for Satan to desecrate in the third year of the tribulation. It will be gone. It won't be there. When that earthquake hits and those plates move together, that whole area right here, the lower city and the temple mound, Mount Moriah, fall down. And everything on it goes with it. That's not even part of the lesson, but that's just there. All right, so he says he wept. Of a certain affinity, Kalyo is to wail aloud, uh, showing his compassion that he's fully man and fully God at the same time. He knows all that is coming that week and into the future. The crowd is shouting hallelujahs in sheer joy, and he's weeping, overwhelmed with sorrow. This is a stronger word than just the cry. It's the strongest in the Greek for sobbing sorrow. In John chapter 11, verse 35, it says, Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus. That's the word to just cry. That's a normal type cry. The one he's used here is a word for heavy sobbing. The body's moving, convulsing with agony, gripped in sorrow as he cries over the city. He knows what's coming and how fast it's coming. At this, after this day, we don't hear any praise coming out of the crowds at Passover. He goes in, 
doesn't do what they expect. There's no more cheers. There's no praise for him. And even after he rose from the dead, you don't hear any praise offered to him from the masses. They turn against him because he doesn't do what they expected him to do. They wanted their Messiah to do certain things, and he doesn't do what they were looking for. So it says there, verse 42, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from their eyes. Barnes says in his commentary, If thou hast known, says he, even thou with all thy guilt, the things that make for thy peace, if thou hast repented and been righteous and had received the Messiah, if thou hast not strained, stained thy hands with the blood of the prophets and shouldest not that with the Son of God, then these terrible calamities would not come upon thee. If thou hast known. What a sad set of words. He's there and you don't know what's right there in front of you. This thy day. It's not talking about just this Monday as he's coming into the city. But this is the time that he's been present with him. This era. If you'd known this thy day. This time frame. That I've been present with you in the nation. The things which belong unto thy peace. If you don't believe the things that made for peace. The salvation message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. They would not do that. And then he says, but now they are hid from thine eyes. They chose to be unbelieving, hard-hearted, self-righteous rejectors of Christ. Just like today we have a lot of people that are never Trumpers. These were the never Christ. They had no way they, had no way they wanted anything to do with him. Jesus gave them invitation after invitation after invitation. All through that three-year ministry, he's preaching salvation to the religious leaders. While he's giving it out to everybody else, he's also zeroing in on their self-righteous religion. And they rejected them all, therefore they rejected peace with God. This goes right back to the Old Testament. I pulled two passages, one from Psalms and one from Isaiah. Psalm 81, 13. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways. They had not hearkened unto him. They did not walk in the ways of the Lord. They came up with their own rules of self-righteous religion, working their way to heaven. Isaiah 48, 18. Oh, thou that, oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. The contrast. If you'd hearkened to my commandments, you would have had peace flowing like a river. And you'd had righteousness rolling in like the waves of the sea. But you wouldn't do it. What he, lay, what he says lays all the blame on Jerusalem, for the impending ruin, it's all upon herself. She's the one that brings this doom to her. MacArthur says the peace he's referring to has no connection to the earthly conditions with Rome or the Jewish leadership. It's a personal peace of being reconciled to God. If you'd known the peace that was there that would reconcile you with the Father because their religion ignored the Father. They went through a lot of motions. In fact, if you look at it in Luke 13, he's already addressed this with them. In verse 33, he talks there, uh, they tell him about Herod wanting to, he better leave, Herod might want to kill him. He says, nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. In other words, I've got to go there to perish. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. And I put that in italics and shadowed it and then highlighted in yellow. But you would not. 
He wanted to gather them, and they refused. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We talked about this last week, that they knew that he'd already said this to them. And it's kind of ironic. They meet him as he tops the hill, and they all start saying this. He's already pronounced judgment with that same statement, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, is spoken, but with really no faith. It didn't cancel out the coming judgment, as evidenced by the fact that they screamed for his blood by the end of the week. Crucify him. Crucify him. We'll not have this man to rule over us. They rejected him. So this was not the blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord that he prophesied. This is the, that's future. That's at the return of Christ to the earth when they see him who they pierced, they're going to cry this out. Israel today's condi- today currently is still under divine judgment. They are God's chosen people for a future salvation, and he will preserve them as a people unto that salvation when he comes back. If you think about all that's going on, I was talking with uh, Thurston and, and Dwayne earlier. If you go to Jan Markell's Understanding of the Times, she had an interview with, uh, uh, what was the guy's name I said? I didn't write down his name. Something with a C. I wrote down that Jan Markell, Understanding the Times. Anyway, uh, uh, Billy, Billy Crumb. He has a 24 lesson, 12 DVD that covers the tribulation period and and all this stuff that's going on prophecy wise. Interviews with people in Jerusalem, part of the temple uh, group that's going to be be there to build the temple. And he's got these videos where the interviews there. They've already got the priests trained. They've already identified through DNA genetically somebody that is appointed now as the high priest. They've got everything built. The only thing they haven't built that would be needed to establish the sacrifices is the Ark of the Covenant. And they say boldly on the tape, we don't need to build that. We know where it is. We found it 20 years ago but we couldn't bring it out because we don't have a temple to put it in. They've got everything ready. They say inside of six months they could have the temple built up there on the mountain. Totally function. They're ready. They're pushing forward for this fourth temple for Satan to desecrate. It's got to be there. So these people think they're going to reestablish the sacrificial system to honor God but they're just fulfilling prophecy. He's preserving those people. He's in control. So all you can say right now is, but for now, that day, Barnes says the national wickedness is too great. The cup is full. Mercy is exhausted. And Jerusalem with all her pride and splendor and the glory of her temple and the pomp of her service must perish. And perish they did because in 70 A.D., Forty years later, you had the destruction of Jerusalem. MacArthur says, Since that time, Jerusalem has been trodden underfoot to one degree or another by the Gentiles, and the time of the Gentiles ends. You go there now, the stones are still down. There's rubble on the ground in the valley. All this stuff that was built up there had been leveled by the Romans. That's all been rebuilt by Muslims and others as they came in and occupied that land. And some of the Jews that are back there now are still rebuilding. The truth is hidden from your eyes. The gospel of peace, the only way of reconciliation with God, is hidden from their eyes because of their hardness. They will not believe until the end time when they look on him whom they pierced, as Zechariah said, and mourn for him as an only son. And then they will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Right, the, the two prophecies verses here that Jesus says, For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. For the days shall come upon thee. It's used many times in the Old Testament to announce judgment. Uh, you can look up the others there later, but Isaiah chapter 39, verse 6. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up and store to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And it talks about that a son shall be taken and made eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And then Hezekiah said Hezekiah to, to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken, for he said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. That's where Isaiah confronts Hezekiah when the ambassadors come from Babylon, and he asks him, What did you show them? And he goes, Oh, I showed them everything. Showed them everything in the temple, all the gold, all the service instruments, the utensils. And sure enough, they came back and took it all away. For the day shall come upon thee. Suddenly, quickly, as they did within 40 years after this, it happened. Cast a trench about thee. Unlike the days, meaning when we think of a word trench, we think about digging a big ditch. Back then it was a rampart. Uh, I can't think of the word now. It starts with a P. Oh well. It's, they built up this wall. First they made one out of wood. And the Jews snuck out at night and set it on fire and burned it down. Well, that didn't set too good with Titus. So they built another wall, this time out of stone and rocks. And it took them ten days to build this wall that went five miles around the city. Ten days to build that wall. And they had ten forts in it where they could man them. And anybody that came out of that city to try to escape, to get through the wall, they would kill. They, they closed them in. And this is what Titus Vespian did according to Josephus, the historian. The city is sealed off. No supplies can enter and no one can leave. Anyone trying to escape would be killed. Thousands on the inside are going to starve to death. MacArthur's commentary says, Titus surrounded the city on April the 9th, cutting off all supplies and trapping thousands of people who had been in Jerusalem for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread that had just completed. The Romans systematically built embankments around the city, gradually starving the city's inhabitants. The Romans held the city in this manner through the summer, took five months of siege, defeating various sections of the city one by one with the final overthrow occurring in early September. Five months. Ten days to build it, five months to starve them out and take it over. They compass them round and keep the inn on every side. They fulfill that prophecy. Jesus spoke it, and that's what happened. This all started in 66 AD. The Jews started a revolt, and in 70 AD, Caesar sends them down there to go after them. Verse 44, and shall lay thee even with the ground. They slowly took over parts of the city in stages as the people weakened and could not fight them. They laid them to the ground. Means they came in there and utterly destroyed the city, the temple, the residents, and the people. And the children with them, men, women, and children, were brutally slaughtered by the tens of thousands. They came in with the sword, killing the men and women. They picked the kid children up by their feet and slammed them against the wall, busting their heads open. Brutal. Before they killed the parents, they were slaughtering their children by beating them against the stones. That's why Christ was sobbing physically over the future of the city. The few strong young men that survived were carried off to become gladiators to fight in Rome for amusement. 
The word there raised, it means to lay even with the ground. Ephodzo. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. When they came to the temple, they threw the stones down. They flattened it out. The platform up there is flat. The temple was removed. They rolled them all the stones off the mount. Barnes says at the time this was spoken, no event was more improbable than this. The temple was vast, rich, splendid. It was the pride of the nation, and the nation was now at peace, even though occupied by Rome. They started their own revolt in 66. They started attacking and killing the Romans and trying to throw them out. And the Caesar said, that's enough. Go down there and wipe them out. Originally, Caesar wanted to save the temple. But that was not God's plan. And things didn't work out that way. We'll cover in a minute. In Micah chapter 3, verse 12, Therefore shall Zion, for your sake, be plowed as a field. And Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountains of the house as the high places of the forest, plowed as a field. Josephus, by the way, anybody not know who he is? Josephus was a historian. Somehow, he had left the city when the Romans came in. He was on that side. They took him in, allowed him to stay, he gave them information about the history and they allowed him to stay there and record what was taking place. He was definitely an antichrister. What he writes in history in no way was intended to verify anything Christ did. It's pure Jewish, we're the greatest nation, and what he fulfills shows where Christ's prophecies were fulfilled is not pre-planned by him. He's stating the facts of what took place. He had no intention of verifying anything that Christ said. So he says here, Titus gave orders that they should now demolish the whole city and the temple except three towers, which he reserved standing. But for the rest of the wall, it was laid so completely even with the ground by those who dug it up from the foundation that there was nothing left to make those believe who came hither that it was ever that had ever been inhabited. They took the temple and raked it off, and then they went through the city and leveled all the houses. They plowed it like a field. They upended everything. They dug up the foundations of even the houses and the streets. Uh, <clears throat> I can't pronounce that guy's name. Another Jewish writer also recorded that Terranetus Rufus, an officer in the army of, the, of Titus, with a plowshare tore up the foundations of the temple that the prophecy might be fulfilled. Zion shall be plowed as a field. All right, so MacArthur says, Titus, the Roman general, built large wooden scaffolds around the walls of the temple building, piled them high with wood and other flammable items, and set them ablaze. The heat from the fires was so intense that the stones crumbled, the rubble was then sifted to retrieve the melted gold, and the remaining ruins were thrown down into the Kidron Valley. It started out with the Jews went in there to some of those houses along the side that I showed you in the picture and set fire to some of the storehouses. Well, the Romans got mad, went in there and stormed and threw stuff inside of the temple and set the Holy of Holies on fire. And then Titus brings in and they build all this stuff up on the outside, set it on fire, and all the gold runs off, and then the rocks crumble because of the heat. The marble cracked and fell apart in the heat. The stones of the temple cry out God's judgment against the nation. Though they utter no sound, they scream of the power and the sovereignty of God Almighty. Anybody, Christian, Muslim, whoever goes to that city and looks at the damage and the remains, that rock is crying out, God is sovereign. Jesus was God, prophesied 
that this would happen, and 40 years later, it did. Titus came in, and even though Caesar originally wanted to save the building, well, he wasn't in control. The Jews started a fire, the Romans reacted, and then Titus says, okay, build scaffolding, let's melt the gold. We're not saving it. Why all of this? How tragic all of this is. Because that last phrase there, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus' utter destruction was divine judgment for their failure to recognize and embrace their Messiah when he visited them. The day of visitation is an Old Testament phrase referring to the coming of God is drawing near to his people. It can be for blessings, but it can also be for judgment. This time, it was for judgment. Everything Jesus did, said, every miracle, proved that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. They didn't want to believe it. They rejected him. How true is this statement in John chapter 1, the very start of the gospel? He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. This passage in Luke ought to make those verses even more saddening to you as a Christian. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him. Rejection of Jesus Christ is catastrophic. And rejection of Jesus Christ for us today as Lord is catastrophic for you too. You have been in church, heard the gospel, had a spiritual opportunity for salvation. So the question has to be asked, what have you done with your visitation? Every one of us needs to look and say, what have we done with the visitation that God gave us? Have we accepted Him as Savior? Have the people we witnessed to accepted Him? Are they facing the judgment of God? If they don't repent, they face eternity in hell. And if they are alive at the rapture, they're going to go through the tribulation. They've had a visitation. If they've heard the gospel, what have they done with it? And what are we doing with it today? In our own lives, are we totally surrendered to the Lord, doing His will, or are we falling back and saying, I got this, I can handle this on my own, we don't pray, we just do and go through the motions and we become religious just like the Pharisees. It's so easy to become a legalistic, religious person. As I was getting ready for this lesson, I was thinking about how many times have I stood over there. That's the temple for us today to worship God in, a house of prayer. How many times do I stand over there and sing any songs? And it's not moving my heart. It's just words that I've learned and I'm just saying them over. And 